Matthew chapter 26. Uh, the text that we will be looking at today will begin in verse 65, and I will um, go to verse 68. And this is uh, Christ before Caiaphas uh, on the evening of his most uh, crucial time. Uh, this is uh, Matthew's account, um, and we pick up at verse 65 in Matthew 26. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have heard, him, heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered. He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. And others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? And we'll end there. Now, this text comes in, in the context that uh, Caiaphas, as you know, had, had just put the question to Christ. Tell us plainly, are you the Christ? And uh, he uh, affirms that he indeed is the Messiah. And um, on the heels of this is our text where outrage by the Pharisees uh, comes into play and um, they spit on his face and beat him with their fists as they are outraged at his blasphemy. So I want to consider this text under the sermon title, Spitting on the Face of Jesus. And I want to look at uh, three things this evening. First of all, the, the hypocrisy of the high priests. Um, you notice in verse 65, the high priest tears his robes. Uh, this is a, an act in the Jewish culture of, of utter disgust. It's to say, I am parting with the issue or the individual that uh, is being faced, but I have no part to do with this. And it is a, a, just a, a rich sign of utter emotional disgust and grief. Um, it's as if the the fabric of the relationship is being torn apart um, willingly. Um, so here they're saying, I'm, I will have absolutely nothing to do with this guy out of a sort of a religious uh, piety and uh, this individual who is just uh, not even worth associating with. We ask the question, what was so offensive in Christ's claiming to be the Messiah? Well, they're calling it blasphemy. Um, this is clear in the text. He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard him blaspheme. And of course, uh, that blasphemy would have been something they would have been looking for all along because their, their intent was to kill uh, Jesus from the beginning. Um, now, from their perspective... Um, for an imposter to claim to be the Messiah, um, if you believe Christ is not the Messiah, and he claims to be the Messiah, you are going to be at loggerheads. Uh, you're going to assume he's a fraud claiming to be the Messiah. But if, if one would pull back from that a moment and just simply say, if he is speaking truth, and he actually is the Messiah, uh, this would be the polar opposite of blasphemy. This would be the call that they would have to bow the knee to the one that God had sent uh, for them. And so their perspective is wrong. Their assumptions are wrong. And if they begin with a faulty premise, then the conclusion is going to be wrong. And uh, this is uh, what happens on this occasion uh, but the, the hypocrisy in the Pharisees um, is just all over the place in this text. And you wonder, where is Caiaphas's outrage at the numerous biblical, um, the violations of biblical law on this occasion? Uh, how many injustices were allowed to be perpetrated on this 
uh, this one who is the accused that stands before them. Um, they have a trial that's held in the middle of the night uh, against biblical law. They were to have that in, in the daytime when witnesses could see what was going on. They entertained a false testimony by two witnesses under the guise of gaining the two witnesses that was necessary to get the guilty verdict. Uh, they had not um, done what was necessary in terms of wisdom in interviewing the two witnesses separately to see if their stories indeed match. Um, they... Uh, were to investigate these two witnesses also with the intention that had those witnesses conspired that the death would be required of them because what they were doing is bringing about a charge of blasphemy that carried the death penalty. And according to Deuteronomy 19.19, 19, uh, their lives would have been required had they conspired to bring a false testimony. And so the, uh, the charges are serious here. And uh, the, um, these uh, Caiaphas and the others are not, uh, are not at all um, concerned about the seriousness of that. No charges had been presented to Christ, the accused. No defense attorney had been provided and a host of other violations. And even Caiaphas, the high priest, who tears his clothes, was contrary to biblical law. In Leviticus 21.10, we read these words. The priest, who is the highest among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil has been poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor tear his clothes. And so even this act of tearing his clothes was forbidden. And yet Caiaphas presents himself as if he's one who's concerned about the uh, biblical law and to put to death the one who blasphemes. And the thing that I would impress upon us all this evening would be to recognize that when it comes to God's word, when it comes to God's law, we're not... Uh, at liberty to pick and choose which laws we will uh, hold to, which ones we are going to abide by. Now, I realize there has to be some context to that. We realize the whole of Revelation and all it speaks about that has to be understood. But in this case, uh, these uh, Pharisees um, are not holding to biblical law as it was given, and a number of violations that they have, um, have uh, committed against that law. So if blasphemy is a concern to Caiaphas, uh, he cannot omit his obligations to the remainder of biblical law. Uh, this is what the Apostle Paul was bringing out in Romans 2, uh, where in 2, 1 through 3, Three, he says, um, therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, that when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So if Caiaphas is so concerned about biblical law um, and he's violating biblical law, how does he condemn another one who's breaking that law? So uh, interesting. That, now here's uh, something else that is going to play into this. Blasphemy in a... Roman Empire is not going to be as offensive as it would to a Jewish culture. In Jewish law, blasphemy would be, uh, you know, is, is a death penalty. But in the Roman Empire, uh, you could worship whatever gods you wanted to worship. Uh, the only requirement was that you gave a pinch of salt. You acknowledged Caesar as Lord. 
you declared him to be God, and you could worship whatever God you wanted to. They had a whole pantheon of gods. And so um, to declare someone or something God was not nearly the offense in a Roman uh, culture. Uh, and what happens here, and this is where the, the uh, hypocrisy becomes even more evident, is that the grounds of outrage for the, the Pharisees on this occasion, blasphemy, is suspiciously not the charge that is brought before Pilate. When they bring Jesus before Pilate, uh, the charge is changed from blasphemy to tax evasion and treason against Caesar. Uh, notice how Luke records the, uh, the uh, occasion where in Luke 23, 1 and 2, then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Now again, you notice the lie here, the false report that is being given on this occasion. Had Christ indeed taught that it was, that it was wrong to pay taxes to Caesar? That he forbid the culture from paying taxes to Caesar? On the contrary, he told them, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. He even had Peter, remember, pull the, the uh, fish out and uh, grab the coin from the fish's mouth and pay the tax with it. He was not one who was um, a tax revolutionary, uh, but he rendered to Caesar the taxes that were due to Caesar. And so this was a, an outright lie. And so Caiaphas and the others have hypocritically judged Christ. They were accusing him of violating God's law of blasphemy, while they, at the same time, are violating a host of other laws. And yet, they find our Lord worthy of death. That's just a, 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 an amazing uh, aspect about the charges of Christ. And as he's standing here, a righteous individual who's speaking the truth gets charged with capital crimes. Now, that's the hypocrisy of, the, uh, uh, of Caiaphas on this occasion and the Pharisees more broadly. But then secondly, the determined penalty in this text is that it is Christ is going to be now put to death. Remember, that was the, the crime uh, of blasphemy was a capital offense, according to Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24, 16, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him. And notice how this applied. The alien as well as the native, not unique to Jews, but this is a principle of all nations, the, the alien as well as the native. Uh, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. And so this is a right recognition of the punishments due to blasphemy. If Christ indeed had blasphemed, they got the punishment right, but that's about all that they get right. And now Caiaphas then is looking to his counselors and asks him in verse uh, 66, what do you think? And they answer, he deserves death. So death it is for the capital crime of blasphemy. Jewish uh, scholar and theologian Alfred Edersheim said, we bear in mind that the decision to sacrifice Christ had for some time been taken. Terrible as the proceedings of that night were, they seem a sort of concession, as if the Sanhedrinists would fain have found some legal or, and moral justification for what they had already determined to do. And I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, they had wanted to kill the Messiah, they were after him, 
And now they had this feigned court and find him guilty of something that would justify their murderous intents. And so I want to then focus upon what to me is the most gripping, disturbing aspect of the text itself. And that is how this outrage of the rulers is meted out. Notice in verse 67, they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. And others slapped him and said in mockery, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Uh, and if I can impress upon you tonight it just the utter disgust in my own heart as what's going on here and try to bring something to this text. And if I'm successful in this, uh, may all glory go to God. But in my mind as I read this, I, you know, I go back to my brother, Russ. Russ was the uh, black sheep of the family. My, my children call him Crazy Uncle Russ. Uh, Russ never got along with anybody. He just bore a chip on his shoulder uh, from my whole upbringing. He was one year older than me, and every opportunity that he got, he would uh, just really give it to me, really. <laughs> Pound me one way or the other, and just got a particular thrill out of just beating up his younger brother. And I remember there was one week where Russ seemed to know where the barometer was. He could just harass me and antagonize me just enough to know how soon I could get over it. And just about the time you got over it, it was another layer of this, you know, big brother pummeling his younger brother. And I remember one particular week where Russ had just gone too far. And, and I remember that evening there was a block party in our neighborhood where all of the, all of the uh, people got together and we were all bringing our various dishes and stuff. And uh, some of the neighbor... Uh, uh, Neighbors had gotten together and some friends, and uh, our, I remember our assistant scoutmaster had tackled Russ on the ground and was giving him this pink belly. He was slapping his belly, and he said, hey, Dave, go get me some water. So, okay, I give him some water. So he's pouring some water, and he's, he's really harassing Russ. And Russ got up from that, and he was madder than a hornet. And I remember him just running, not, not after everybody else who was there. He came after me. And as he's chasing me, I remember I turned around and I just stared him right in the face. And I'm looking at him and it was this one standoff. And I, I remember that the rage in me and I just spat right in his face. <laughs> and for the one moment in my whole childhood growing up, I felt I had gotten over on Russ for one moment. Then everything went black from there. <laughs> yeah, he kind of laid into me, but that was really a, a moment of satisfaction. But it was in my mind, it was the most disgusting thing I could do to him, the most hateful thing I could do to my brother, because I was so angered at him. And um, this imagery of spitting in the face... Um, it carries that sort of import in my own life. And I don't know if it carries yours, carries that in yours. But, but you think of something about God's mind when he will put into the biblical text something like this in terms of the leveret marriage occasion. I don't know if you remember this, but if a brother would not marry uh, his deceased brother's wife, do you remember what was to happen on that occasion? Uh, in Deuteronomy 25, um, uh, starting in verse 8, um, having to do with that leveret marriage, um, Moses preserves these words for us that come from the mouth of God. Then the elders of his city shall summon him, 
and speak to him if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her. Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of all the uh, elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall declare, this, thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. That this is such a violation of the covenant to not be willing to raise up a, a posterity, a, a heritage, a lineage, that if the brother would not do that for his own brother, uh, that woman had the right to spit in his face. So disgusted was she with him. I remember a, a movie. I don't recommend it because it, it is pretty dark, but I, I watched it as an unbeliever, so that's how I get the excuse. But Sean Penn uh, had a movie years, I don't know, it's probably 30, 40 years ago. Time flies so fast. But I remember Sean Penn in this movie called Bad Boys. And it, Sean Penn um, and his father is played by uh, Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken. And uh, Sean Penn gets in trouble, he, find, he gets incarcerated, and there's this scene where he's going into the prison for the first time, and he is given his clothes as he's just entering into the prison. And all the prisoners have lined up in this gauntlet that he must walk to his cell. And as the initiation for the prisoners, as he's walking through carrying his clothes, everybody is spitting on Sean Penn. And he walks through that gauntlet unflinchingly, just walks as they're just spitting on his face. And from the camera angles, it's not trickery of the film. The camera is going right along, and you're seeing people spit, and the spit is landing on, on Sean Penn's face. And I'm saying to myself, what did Sean Penn negotiate as a prize to make that scene? I would love to see how much he got paid to do that. And, and I'm sure there had to be some kind of clause in there. If we have to have a retake, <laughs> we're going to add more to that. I, I just can't imagine what somebody would do to allow another human being to spit on their face like that unflinchingly. But as I, as I reflect on that, I, I think of Christ who's standing there, the creator of this world, who had never done anything wrong in his entire life, who's standing before these creatures of the dust. And without correction, allows his own creatures to spit in his face. I mean, it's overwhelming. Why does Christ not say something on that occasion? Like, how dare you? I mean, my dear brother here, I'm driving down the hill with him and going through all of my sob stories of the little infractions of, against what I want to be, you know, griping and groaning. But how creatures of the dust can treat their own creator is, is beyond belief. As far back as 700 years before this occasion, the prophet Isaiah writes, I believe, in reference to Christ in chapter 50 and verse 6 of his book, where he writes these words, I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard, and I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. That is really remarkable to me. But here's the thing. 
They had to do a retake. See, Christ didn't walk that gauntlet just once. He had to do a retake. Because if you look down another chapter, in chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel, starting in verse 27, we have this where he is now in the Roman courts, where the soldiers of the governor took Jesus, this is verse 27, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman co cohort around him. And this time, they strip him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And verse 30, And they spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. So it doesn't happen just once, but twice. Christ goes through this humiliating scene and keeps his mouth shut. He, he doesn't say anything in correction. Again, citing Alfred Edersheim, he says this, speaking of this trial, he says, the trial and the sentence of Jesus in the palace of Caiaphas would have outraged every principle of Jewish criminal law and procedure. It was a mockery of a trial. And it ends in one of the most humiliating kinds of treatments to our Lord. Now, what are the lessons that we can learn from something like this? And I would say this, to start with, these are leaders in the church. And we ought to be aware that within the church body, sin can abound. That uh, simply because we're in the church doesn't make us immune from error. And two, sometimes we see how traditions and, and biases can trump truth. And we have to be guarded that we're not holding to our own traditions, but scrutinizing the word for truth. We can learn that mob rule is another way that can trump the word of God. When the masses come together and argue or fight for something, that oftentimes the word of God can get trampled underfoot. And as a leader... I have to say to myself, am I one who falls into that pit of not being careful enough in examining the issues that are brought before me? I want us to consider as well something like this. How much damage can ignorance be to truth? Folly and ignorance is a shame that God has given us the mind of Christ and, and he champions wisdom and truth. A lack of biblical knowledge, unscrutinized presuppositions, a failure to investigate carefully can, can lead to very disastrous ends. And so we need to cultivate a humility when we make decisions and a humbleness when we're correcting. And lastly, I would say this. If there's something to take away from this sermon, spitting in the face of Jesus, I would ask you to consider this, that every time we sin, every time we do something contrary to our own Creator's goodwill. Are we not spitting in the face of Jesus? The language of scripture is we're crucifying him again. We're putting him to open shame. He does this 
because he was paying the price for our sins. He's enduring this to pay the penalty for our sin. It's our sin that brought him to this. And so we, we are culpable. I don't look at my sin enough like that, I confess. But I think if we did, I think we would live holier lives. And I just press you to think, if that's the, the correct application, that we really take sin seriously and uh, seek to obey what our, not only our Savior, but our Lord requires. He requires a holy life. And if he's our Lord, then we're going to submit to him as our Lord. And so, may these things really motivate you this week uh, to living a life uh, more in conformity to his, his calling on your life. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that um, hypocrisy isn't uh, merely in the Pharisees that we too have our own culpabilities, our own hypocrisies, our own falling short. And I pray that you would give to us the kind of grace that we need to uh, live uh, more circumspect in, in our life to, to following all that you have commanded of us I thank you for this very gripping and powerful uh, image of the kind of hatred and shameful things that we can do as your creatures. And we pray for your preserving graces to keep us in the days ahead from falling into such folly. So be glorified, O oh Lord, and forgive us of our own failures and, and make us the kind of people that would be an honor to you and that we would be found to be faithful sons and daughters. And we'll give you the glory in these things. We pray in Jesus' most blessed name. Amen.